have done this seminar with different panelists a couple of times. It seems to be a topic that a lot of lawyers are interested in because we've all heard um, someone along the way tell us, oh, you can do anything with a law degree. And I think um, that a lot of us may have gone to school, law school with that expectation. Um, and I, I think that it's true, as you will see tonight, that there are a lot of people who have gone to law school who are now doing other things. But I think that you will find that that's not always a linear path. Um, that doing one of these alternative careers is often uh, by happenstance, not necessarily a planned route. And when it is a planned route, it is sometimes difficult to get to where you want to go um, because um, there aren't, you know, there's not an on-campus interview that, okay, everybody who wants a non-traditional career, drop your resume here, right? So um, we're going to hear from these uh, uh, people who have done something a little different with their degree and uh, ask them some questions. Certainly, if I'm not asking the questions that you think uh, are important or that you want to know, then uh, raise your hand and uh, we'll try to uh, get, get, get your questions answered. But to give you a context to the conversation tonight, um, let's think about some statistics. The Bureau of Labor says or reports that Americans are likely to have at least 10 different employers during uh, their professional careers. And these statistics were actually taken uh, before the economic downturn of the last couple of years. So um, this is kind of looking at the world as it was in the mid 2000s. Um, most of us will change careers at least three times. That's pretty significant, especially when you think that just a generation ago, it was pretty typical for a lot of people to stay in the same job for their entire professional career. We're talking about changing professions at least three times. Um, to put it in the perspective of the legal profession, um, the National Association of Legal Placement has been conducting a, longitud a longitudinal study started uh, in 2000, and their most recent report um, of law school graduates about three years out of law school, and again, this, these statistics are a little dated, but I think it probably gives you a, a good non-economic crisis perspective, okay, because hopefully we're going to get out of this at some point. But, when you look at uh, recent law school grads, and this is the class of 2000, this is my class. So about eight years out of law school at the time the study was reported, many of the people when they were interviewed were only three years out of law school. The majority, um, excuse me, the majority of the respondents were around three years out of law school. Some had been out a little more because again, they were trying to focus on the uh, class of 2000. Apparently, some students or some graduates sent their survey responses in much quicker than others. Um, but about a third of uh, the respondents had already changed jobs at least once. 18% of the respondents had changed jobs at least two times. This is three years out. 44% at that time had intentions of changing jobs within the next two years and 22% had the intentions of changing jobs within the current year. Now, what can we attribute all this movement to? Now, it was interesting to look at some of the survey results, um, or the results of the survey that you all took this afternoon. You're a pretty happy bunch. Um, I think that over 90% of you reported being very satisfied uh, with your current position. So you, you're either happy or lying, I don't know which, but um, that's unusual. Um, most, the majority of lawyers in most uh, surveys report being dissatisfied with their current job. 40% um, of lawyers have considered leaving the profession altogether. Now, not all of them have done that, um, but it seems to be something that at least crosses our minds every now and then. 
And then prior to the uh, recession, an average of 40,000 lawyers were leaving or walking away from their jobs voluntarily each year. So we're a pretty mobile group. Um, and I would suspect that with the last two years and the economics of the last two years, we're even a little more mobile, um, you know, not necessarily voluntarily than we were uh, when these statistics were reported. So um, what are all those things that you can do with a law degree? That's what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, first, um, Sharon, I'll start with you. Um, did you... Are we good? Okay. Um, did you ever practice in what we might refer to as the traditional uh, law firm setting? Uh, and uh, what prompted you to leave that environment? I was never in a traditional law firm setting. I did work with the Honorable Carol Solomon for right after I got out of law school, who was a wonderful spirit, wonderful lady. Uh, she gave me a lot of opportunities. It was the kind of practice in law where someone gets busted, busted, you know, and then you go out and you sit them in jail and you talk to them. You work with them or someone comes through the door and wants a divorce, you work with that. Anything that came through the door, she would really help me with. And that's one thing I have to say. I have been very fortunate to have female lawyers who have really, really, really helped me. And, you know, to work with you and encourage you. Uh, and I think that it makes a lot of sense to people who want an alternative career in the law to start off practicing law for a period of time. I would always buy someone to start off doing that. And then later down the road, use some of the legal skills that you develop in order to do other positions. Okay, great. Um, who on the panel then ha did practice in a traditional law firm setting and who would like to talk about it? <laughs> so the one person. <laughs> this is going well. Okay. Um, I'll, 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 I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Back to most embarrassing moments. <laughs> to avoid, <laughs> to avoid Mr. That. Freeman having to talk about his most embarrassing moments. <laughs> I wouldn't want to embarrass Dave like that. Um, I did. I practiced law for ten years uh, at um, what is now Adams and Reese, but was Stokes Bartholomew at the time. And uh, so I, I mean, I did a variety of practice. It was a, it was a small firm when I got there, 10 or 12 lawyers, and probably 30 lawyers when I left. Um, and, and the truth is, the reason I thought was a lot less, but I, I quit practicing. Uh, I was actually the managing partner for the last three years I was there. And after three years of managing 30 lawyers, I decided that I needed to find another career. <laughs> and and that's, not, that's really not totally true. I actually got a chance to go do some state government work for a couple of years, and I fully intended to go back and practice law. Uh, but after being away from it for um, about a two-year period, um, I sort of had to decide whether I want to go back and practice law or, or go into the investment banking side of this thing. On the banking side, and I decided uh, that, uh, you know, why not try something different and decide to do the banking side. But uh, I did have a traditional practice. We did a little, a little bit of everything for 10 years. They were practicing law for a while, because I remember him. We did some case together, well, not a case, but a bond closing. I think we issued uh, issued bonds for the Nashville airport. Um, and, and Rich, of course, is being pretty modest. Uh, when you do a great job, you get uh, you get opportunities, and I think that's probably what is the best way to describe you know the way Rich has has had a chance to move around in and out of the uh, law profession. Um, I was at Waller. Actually, I started out out of law school down in Dallas and uh, decided I wanted to come home, but spent uh, several great years at Waller Lanston. And uh, I guess my story was I was uh, a baby lawyer stuck in a, uh, in a dungeon room doing due diligence and uh, scared to death because nobody would tell me what due diligence was. Uh, so, yeah, that was that was the classic phrase, and I kept saying no, I won't. And, uh, and so, you know, I came out knowing way too much about our clients' business, and um, you know, somewhere along the way, uh, there was an opportunity to talk to the client about 
uh, helping them, and I did, and uh, it, it just kind of it morphed. Um, there were there were. I, I tell people now, I did not go into the business that I ended up in, um, but uh, you, know, you, you, t you have a chance sometimes to either throw up your hands and say I quit or you, or you figure it out. Um, and I was lucky enough to, to stumble in the right direction a few times. But I, I, I'll, uh, I'll agree with with what was said earlier, uh, sometimes I'll get a chance to go talk to law students and, and I'll hear this phrase of, of um, well, I just came to law school to get a law degree, but I never planned to practice law. And I tell them, boy, that's, a, that's an incredible amount of work to put in and I don't think you're going to be happy where you end up because I learned, every, everything I learned came from uh, you know, like here in town, guys like Joe Barker and Chase Cole that, that were kind enough to, to take me under their wing and teach me something that was, that was practical about you know, being able to move to another career. Judge Shepley, um, let me ask you this question because I know that you did spend a number of years practicing law and then uh, were on the bench. Was that a decision? Did, did you see that as a progression of your legal career, or uh, was that uh, your opportunity to do something different? Well, you have to realize that in uh, 1976, when I graduated from law school, uh, and I was in the same class as Barbara Haynes, uh, and I don't know, there were like six so women in my class out of a hundred, and I don't know, maybe there were 15 out of Vanderbilt class. I mean, 1976 was really the first time there were any, any women in numbers. And of course, that class liberated the men's bathroom room because there was no close where the classes were. So, I mean, we're, we're talking a very different time. You didn't like come and say, oh, I think I'll be a corporate lawyer or I'll do this or that. I mean, there were zero opportunities, really. And so you just kind of took whatever was there, and mostly it meant that some very kind um, you know, male mentor, friend, <coughs> took you under his wing, because there weren't any her wings to take you under at the time. And uh, so I first started with Henry Hale. I don't know if he, Bill Cope remembers Henry. Uh, my first case was getting, uh, was selling about eight properties in North Nashville for a deceased drug dealer. And I learned a lot about that in law school, you know. So I learned how to auction things. I learned how to, you know, you just, uh, all the various common sense that you ever knew or learned or were smart enough to ask somebody about is really what being a lawyer is about. Then I worked for um, Steve North as a law clerk. He was the first judge who ever hired law clerks in the circuit area. And then uh, Judge, then now deceased Judge Shriver, who was in the DA's office, he hired uh, Tom Thurman and I, who's now the deputy DA, to start the child support division. We knew nothing about this. He gave us no instruction. And we got 4,000 applications that we were supposed to organize and deal with. And there were no computers. The best we had were Rolodexes. Uh, so I did that for three years. Then I joined up with Margaret Ben, and we were shipping them for 10 years. At that time, it was fairly extraordinary that two women started law firm. Now it's nothing. But at the time, it was. Uh, Fairly unusual. So that law firm, the reason I probably ran for judge was that law firm was very instrumental in helping, uh, you know, it was the new way of good politicians. You had honest, not honest, that's not a good word, uh, qualified, you know, that's not a good word. <laughs> we got elected, but anyway, they were good people and they got elected to public defender and judges. And we helped uh, Judge 
campaigns become the first general session. She was the first woman elected general session. So, you know, that's the politics I was swimming in that. So, you know, you just kind of took an opportunity and uh, I ran against Harry Lester, who was an incumbent, which, you know, innocent me, I didn't realize that was like a really big deal. Uh, but I had a lot of fun and all of the skills that I had ever learned to meet people. I used to be an old minister's daughter. You know, you can meet anybody if you got a purpose. And, you know, eventually got elected. And I think uh, Judge Haynes and I, we both kind of helped the court system move into the 20th century. And, uh, you know, that was a very interesting time. Uh, and I did that for 16 years. Now, I guess what you learned from all of that is I think it was very helpful as a judge that actually I did know what it meant for people to practice law. Uh, and during that whole time, I also learned a whole lot about mediation and brought a lot of that to the system, and that's what I'm doing now. So I've kind of come full circle. Uh, later as we talk, I'd like to talk a little bit more about women lawyers and children. Dennis, why don't you tell us a little bit about your uh, road to here and um, where you started and, and how you got to where you are now. Okay, well I was a late bloomer and I went to school because I didn't care whether I practiced law, I just wanted an advanced degree. So, so um, I actually, um, uh, I went, to, went back to school when I was 30 and uh, I always say I crammed four years into 14, and then uh, went on to law school in San Diego and finished here in Nashville, Vanderbilt. And um, I just started shaking hands. I came to Nashville because I wanted to be in the music business, and I just started shaking hands with anybody I could run into and not ask for anything, just say hello. And, Judge Shipley says, if you have a purpose, you can meet anybody, and that was my purpose. And uh, uh, went to work for Tennessee Medical Association for two years, uh, which was a wonderful place to work, and I could have made a, a career there, but it just wasn't in my heart. I didn't have a passion for it, but I only had to work 35 hours a week, and I could go out and meet people the rest of the time. <laughs> so, so that was really good, and uh, and Haley Williams was really great to me. And um, but I finally had to quit and uh, follow my passion. And it, it took uh, it took many years. I was writing songs. I was practicing law out of my house, only doing contracts. I've been in the courtroom about four times in my life, and scared to death every time. Uh, fortunately, the uh, the judges and the staff were very kind to me and saw me quivering, so they, they were very nice. And um, uh, I'd never really had to do that, and I, I caught on with the firm uh, for a little while, and, um, and uh, finally CSAC called me because I had a creative side, and I had a business side, and a legal side, and I've been there now for 14 years uh, growing with the company, and it's the longest by far I've ever been anywhere. And, uh, and uh, but it was really, you know, through the, through the 90s, I, I think in 1993, my adjusted gross income was about $6,000. Uh, but, but, you know, I, I had to, uh, it was something I had to do. And, and I really did have a purpose. And I, that's why I came here, was to be in the, in the industry. And I didn't know where it would end up. But, um, during that time, I used to watch the movie Patton uh, when I was um, when I was down about having a difficult time getting to do what I wanted to do. And there's a scene in Patton where George C. Scott has not been uh, has not been made the uh, head of the D-Day invasion, and Omar Bradley got to do it, and, and George C. Scott is with his personal aide, and he's saying. God will not deny me my opportunity. God will give me a chance to fulfill my destiny. Right on. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> 
<laughs> and so, and so I, had, I had a lot of lean years um, until until CSAC called, and then it was a tough choice. I, I won't go on much longer. I'm sorry. It was a tough. It was a tough choice because it was. I had actually decided to go to just practice law by myself, uh, and it was the year I, I was really turning a corner, and I was going to do okay in, as as a lawyer. And CSAC called, and I, I think I might have lost a little money that first year, but it was too good an opportunity, so I, I went to work there and, and work with songwriters and work with uh, with uh, industry executives, and it, it's it's really fulfilled a lot. It's been great. So I'm glad George C. Scott kept me going. Well, I think that's an interesting point that you raise, uh, talking about um, making making your current job or making your current situation work for you. The example that you gave with the Tennessee Medical Association that it may not have been in the music industry that you wanted to be in, but you saw the opportunity of just working 35 hours a week, kind of freeing up some extra time, and you utilize that extra time to make introductions and, or, and meet people. And I, I think that's a really good point. Is there anyone else on the panel um, who might like to speak to that. Um, now that we all know where you've worked before, you don't have to name names, but maybe talk about a time when you weren't completely satisfied with your current job, but you had you had a goal, and maybe what you did to uh, reach that goal without, you know, making anyone uncomfortable. I don't want you telling me. Oh. I'm not trying to release oh. any skeletons in no, anyone's closet. I, I tried to stick to the question that was asked. But I, I have my primarily in my career, I've worked in corporate law and insurance law, mergers, acquisitions, as well as employment law, whatever you do as a corporate attorney. Prior to my present position, I was general counsel of my company. That's why I always say it's always good to practice law first. And in the corporate environment, as well as the state regulatory environment, I was assistant commissioner of commerce and insurance. One thing that you get as far as for me the opportunity working in state government and working in a corporate environment up until this most recent position you really do have a little bit more flexibility as a time schedule i have two children who are adults now but it gave me the opportunity to be the kind of mother i wanted to be i think things are a little bit different you know i graduated from law school in 83 so i'm sort of back in the day before you know people even gave women a break you know when you went into law firms you know it just you know was just grueling 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 and so it did give me the opportunity to spend with them and that was one of my considerations and actually it worked out very well because i really ended up it's funny because when i see people who are at law firms they always say, when I was in my previous position before this one, they said, well, you have the job we all want. <laughs> because after a period of time, I think the corporate world equals up to the uh, uh, private law firm world, and you really have the, both, the best of both worlds. Does, does anyone else want to talk about the making your job work for you? Or maybe, David, you mentioned taking advantage of opportunities as they're presented to you. I think. Sometimes we may miss when those opportunities are coming up. How do you, how do you recognize them, and, and what has been your experience in creating those opportunities? Well, that's a hard one. Um, you know, for me, it was uh, it was kind of a once in a lifetime. You know, and, and I never looked at it that way. But in hindsight, you know, when you get to look back 20 years, yeah, it turned out to be a once-in-a-lifetime, you know, path that I went down. Did you let me, do that let, me make this, let me make this observation about it. Because over the years, uh, you know, I've had a lot of, you know, I, I practiced at, at two big firms here in town. And I, you know, and I had a lot of people come up to me over, over time, and they'd say, David, I, I'm so envious because you're building something that one day, you know, you'll be able to, if it's a success, you know, you won't have to go in and work an hour to make a dollar. You know, you'll, you'll be able to build a structure where you can go to the beach and you're making just as much money. And yeah, that's true. 
Uh, it, it, it worked out that way. The odds of it working out that way are incredibly small. Just, you know, I was just lucky. But what I would tell people uh, after a certain number of years of, of doing what I was doing and, you know, the, the industry that I picked out, um, I didn't enjoy it. Uh, I used to tell people every day, I come to work and it is all about the money because I hate what I'm doing and I don't really enjoy the people I'm doing it with. And when I look back at the days I spent at Waller and the days I spent at Ferris Warfield and I think about the quality of the people that I got to go be around every day, that was... Uh, I think that's something that lawyers practicing in big firms and having to grind it out every day, uh, and it's hard, I, I know it is, uh, I didn't enjoy it, but, uh, but that is something that I think you take, for, you take for granted when you're practicing in a big firm, is just the quality of the people that you get to be around every day, from your partners to the support staff, I mean, I never showed up a single day practicing law and wondered, my only concern was how I would do. I never worried about anybody else that was around me. And then when I got into uh, hauling waste around, that was all I did every day. Uh, I was basically the HR department. And, and at the end, you know, we're doing business in 30-something states. I had 12 employees whose only job was to be on the payroll and show up and go cover for whoever just decided not to show up that day. It took 12 people out of a, and I only had, you know, what, 100, 150 employees. And it was just a way of life that I came to accept that, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't the same as I had, had uh, grown to expect, you know, even through law school and your classmates. So don't take that for granted. You know, I, I really respect what, what you're saying, and I, I find, I can't say that I've experienced that I've never worked in a big firm. But, you know, I know and have gotten to know uh, friends with a lot of lawyers that work very hard. They work very long hours and probably get paid pretty well. And there are, I think, certain times in one's life that one has to do that, especially if you have a family. Now, I also find what's very interesting I do, right now, I do a lot of mediation with um, uh, just folks, with families, you know, they're getting divorced. People who have been divorced, getting divorced 20 years, 25 years, you know, not like five or something. And I really see that the role, particularly of the male professional, whether they're the lawyer or the doctor or, I don't know, dentists don't seem to be too bothered, especially those two, doctors and they work incredibly hard. You know, the doctor sees 63 patients a day. Or, you know, I just spent the weekend with my cousin, the uh, heart surgeon. So, what's your day like, Gerhardt? Well, I wake up at 6 o'clock, and I call the guy in the OR, and he tells me, okay, which ones are we going to do today? I show up at 7.30, and we do two or three heart operations a day. Okay, you know, your life is in your hands. And I am really, really trying to understand even better when I'm dealing a lot with male professionals and the, what the kind of pressure that they have on them. Now, I think it is different for women professionals. This may be heresy, but you know, I'm an old feminist. I can kind of say what I want. And, uh, <laughs> but I think a lot of, there are so many women now. 50% of all the law schools are women. Okay. I look at these mentees, there's a whole bunch of women here. 
Okay? And I think that is absolutely wonderful. You are spending a lot of time and a lot of money. Okay? But you also have in your hearts and minds what else you want to do, and that's to deal with your families. Now, I think women do have more choices. I'm sorry, but I think they do. They are, can always fall back on, I'm going to stay home with my children. Okay. Now, why, why that is important is because women can sort of enter the um, workforce in different ways. Men generally kind of like go straight up. You stay at Waller Lanston for 10 years or until you figure out something that maybe is more interesting to you. Women who don't like being a baller lands and they go someplace else. You know? Because there aren't very many women partners anymore. There aren't very many women litigators. You know? And most of them have found the better path for them, which is in corporate. There's all kinds of corporate counsel now. There never used to be any. But now, because that seems to be a path where you can balance life and law, seems to be a pretty good fit. But, you know, I just want you to think about that. You know, it's great to raise children, but it's kind of hard to get back into that 10 years later. Okay. And when you don't, you know, you're not as interesting a person. You know? Things happen. And I really think if you have spent all this time and all this money, you should do something with your law degree. And uh, you know, I, I say that as an old thing. I don't even have children. But, you know, we didn't have children when I was in law school. You either had them or you waited forever to have them. And I was too late. So I just want you to think about that. If you are a woman who wants to be a litigator, you've got two choices if you want to have a family. Either you hire a nanny for each child or you hire a husband that does not work 14-hour days. <laughs> Okay, you talk, you talk to her. You can't do it. It's not possible. So you need to take that into account when you are making a, a choice about your life partner. Is this someone that both of you can work through that? Because two 14-hour-a-day persons are not going to be very happy, or someone else is going to raise your children. So you have all of those choices. And one last thing is women make a lot. When I look at, you know, like women who earn a lot of money, that's not me. Okay. But these really high dollar people who are successful, if you look at their lives, it is not like that. It's like here and here and here and here. It's almost like a, a layered cake. And really when you look at any one of these people, that's what they have done. They have gone in different directions. They may not have liked it. They took advantage of that opportunity. Well, some got a better deal out of this than others did. <laughs> Would you acknowledge that? I appreciate that. And, and so that's just, that's much. Look, let's talk a little bit about that change that you reference uh, there at the end and that a couple of others of you have mentioned. Um, I think as lawyers, we either start out being risk averse or after three years of law school and however many years of practice we become very risk averse. Um, but yet all of you have talked about um, the change or approaching change, taking advantage of the opportunity for change. Um, your paths weren't necessarily linear. Um, there were stops and starts. Um, how do you approach the idea of change? I mean, was this something that you embraced? Was it something that was scary to you? Um, are any of you willing to, to tell us that and maybe how you dealt with, um, it, or how you came to the point at which you were ready to accept change? Um, Rich, do you want to start us off on that? Yeah, I, I think it really comes down to 